chamber, uh, the questions and the discussion is driven by you, the members. Um, so we encourage you to be interactive. Um, panelists can build off each other's answers. Uh, so I'm gonna kick it off by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves, um, talk a little bit about uh, their position, and uh, then we'll get the conversation started. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you to uh, the Chamber and Cindy Bradford for all of you for being here. Uh, just a quick introduction. I am, my name is uh, Jaden Romeo. I'm the newer member to the 136th Assembly District. I represent the towns of Arrogacote, Brighton, and portions of the city of Rochester, the north, some of the northwest area, and also the Lincoln Village. Prior to that, I was the uh, Democratic Chair for the Monroe County Democratic Committee. And prior to that, I spent uh, many years working as staff, both in the New York State Senate, but also in the uh, Monroe County Legislature. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and to be part of the conversation. Hi, my name is Natalie Shepard. I'm one of the Commissioner of Schools on the Board of Education for the Rochester City School District, AKA a school board member. Um, and before that, I, um, well, I should say by day, I'm still a social worker um, because the school board position um, is, even though it's a part-time position, it still has full-time work, but my full-time is social work. I am currently with Berkshire Farms. Um, I got into social work because I wanted to work with youth who had been in touch with the juvenile justice system. And from there, I had always been an advocate on the outside of the system and then started getting introduced to different um, public education institutions. And that is how I found my way into the education world. Um, from there, I don't know how I got into politics because I always thought I'd be outside kind of banging, you know, banging on the door. Um, and then the community let me inside, so here I am as a school board member in public education. Um, and I look forward to talking more about what it is that I actually do um, for the school district. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Pam Helming. I represent the 54th Senate District. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the district, it includes Webster here in Monroe County, um, Alloween County, Aliseneca County, parts of Cayuga County, uh, parts of Ontario County, and also Lansing, which is located in Tompkins County. So geographically speaking, it's a huge area. And this morning, uh, I've had the pleasure of crisscrossing the district twice. <laughs> so if I start to nod off, did you know something? No, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's exciting. I feel like I'm up in the big city right now. I want to thank the College at Brockport for hosting this event and also the Chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Shannon, thank you to the Chamber, thank you to the College at Brockport. I am Lovely Warren, Mayor of the City of Rochester. I am an attorney by trade. I also worked for the New York State Assembly for many years and practiced uh, real estate law. Um, I've been, uh, I am in my second year of my second term and excited about what's happening in the city of Rochester to actually build stronger neighborhoods and educate our children, as well as bring jobs and opportunities to our community. So thank you all for being here and I am excited about what's next. Great, does anybody have a question to kick off our discussion? We have one, go ahead. So, very intrigued by um, everyone's background, but very touched by what you said, um, Ms. Uh, Honorable Natalie Sh Shepard, mm -hmm. about working with justice-involved youth, and I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more. You said that, you know, that really uh, kind of brought you in. Could you tell us a little bit more in terms of opportunities for justice-involved youth? I work at Rochester Works, and one of the youth populations that we serve are justice involved youth. All right, so thank you for that question. Um, and I'll try to be brief. I know as a politician, we like to hop the mic, um, but um, <laughs> I'll be brief on my answer. Um, but really with, with juvenile justice, um, the opportunities that present themselves. So I initially went in thinking like, you know, I'm gonna take my education and go in and you know save kids who, who have committed crimes or whatever the case may be. Um, and from there, you wanna think about, well, what is it that got the person in this position so that they don't get back here again? And it was through that work that I started to see that, okay, well, wow, they're really victims to other systems and situations that their family has gone through. And so that work started getting me into understanding how to navigate the different things. So not only do we not see them again, 
um, or when they age out, the, the adult system does not see them. But then how is it that they got here? The crux of that really is if their education was intact or not. Because when you think about it, kids are in school for the majority of the day, majority of their life, K through 12. And so if we're not getting a hold of them then, if we're not um, transforming education in the way that sometimes, and this is not a dig on families or whatever their situations are, but sometimes um, we have to think larger than the fact that we are here to just simply educate a child. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to um, encompass around that, and not only that, uh, when I was in certain school districts and uh, I was a therapeutic foster care coordinator for Hillside, um, I had kids in all the surrounding counties. So I saw how they did it in rural areas and other cities, Buffalo, um, Niagara, Rochester, and just seeing the difference on how um, a school will view a child who has been in touch with the juvenile system. Um, and, and just in regards to that, will they get lawfully what they should get, the support that they lawfully should get, like not even anything extra, right? They would act a certain way if that, per if that child had an agency attached to them or if it was a parent that was advocating for them. And so for me, what I see is opportunity, and we talk a lot about, and I don't want to sound cliche, but we talk a lot about parent involvement and parent engagement and educating parents on how to advocate for their kids. Um, and that is huge, that's a huge piece because it's my thought that a child should only have to really worry about being a child, right? And, and they don't get to decide what family that they're born into. And so a lot of that piece, which is so difficult, is when you don't have an engaged parent or you don't have engaged families, then the system steps in. And if you don't have good workers, I'm sure that you know workers just like you here learning, workers like you and I and other social workers who are invested in the kid's life, that that is really why we also need to be advocating for money into those programs, not just for bodies, but people who will actually fill in that gap. Um, and so that is one opportunity that I see, is just in regards to us changing the way that we look at education, changing how we view, excuse me, view the roles of social workers so that we are filling in some of those adult roles and adult duties and responsibilities for our kids. My name is Kathleen Wright Nose, um, and I, the big question I have right now is what woman do you think has the greatest chance of being our next president? Woo! <laughs> Go girl! <laughs> <laughs> She's not running right now. <laughs> um, well, I think probably what's the exciting part of that is that I don't know if I have the easy top of answer for you off the top of my head because I think the, the number of female candidates we have currently in the running are of such high quality and caliber. And I think that's an exciting thing. We went from a time where we had one to now we have many. Um, and you know the field is still very, very wide um, for president. Who knows the mouse could jump in what I'm talking right now actually. Um, <laughs> but I think that it's it's hard for me to, to pinpoint on one. Um, I you know Personally, I, I like a lot of what Kamala Harris is saying, but Elizabeth Warren has a lot of great policy ideas. You see a really great team, and you hope that all of these people can find ways to continue working together. But I think just the sheer volume that we've seen right now has been, for me, what's been probably the most exciting. Turn the camera off real quick. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to jump off and just say um, at this current moment, this second, I think right now from what has been a hot topic that Elizabeth Warren is, is a front runner at this moment because she's talking about wiping away student debt, which by the way, I am all for it. So if you can make that happen on your first day, like she has my vote, right? Um, but it, it, it's such a crux. And, and again, you know, I'll just echo some of um, Assembly Woman uh, Robio's responses that we have some high caliber women running and that's what's really, really exciting is that you really could put them in a the hat, pull one out and you would probably be satisfied with who you pulled. I'd have to agree with both of you that to me what's most exciting is that we have women in the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like to think that I'm not that old, but I wanted to share with you my experience when I dipped my toe into politics. It was, I applied for a position on our local zoning board of appeals. I was very interested as a mother in protecting our natural resources for my children and the future generations. I live in the Finger Lakes, I represent the Finger Lakes, so preserving those water bodies is really important to me. So I thought I'd apply for this opening I had heard about on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I went in for the interview, and again, it's not that long ago, and the, the town board was there to do the interview, 
And I about fell out of my chair when one of the questions I was asked, is your husband okay with you applying for this? <laughs> what century are we in? <laughs> and then they went on to ask me who was gonna provide childcare for my daughter when I was at these evening meetings. Um, and I thought, thank God they don't realize I'm pregnant with my second one right now. <laughs> I stand no chance. So I think that conversation right now is exciting because there are so many more women entering into politics. And I have to tell you, one of the things I love as state senator, I visit a lot of the school districts in my communities. And a lot of them are very, very rural. And I love going out and inviting young people, the young men and women, to come and shadow my office. We have a, a full complement of students working through the office, whether they come for a day, they come for a week, or they come to visit in Albany and sit in session with me, just to expose them to, hey, government, it's good, it's a good career opportunity, public service is wonderful, it's not all the negative, nasty stuff that you hear in the news or that the media portrays it to be. You can do great things for the people you represent in your communities. So for me, it's just exciting again to see women involved in politics. I agree with the other panelists. I think that um, it is definitely exciting to see not only women involved in politics on a national level, but women involved in politics on a local level. And Rochester in our county has led the way when it comes down to actually electing women and supporting women. And so I commend our, our community for being innovators and forward thinking on, on this matter. Um, to see, you know, a couple years ago, so many women and of all generations show up to Susan B. Anthony's graveside um, when we were hoping to elect the, the, the first woman president. It was absolutely amazing the number of hours people stood in line just to pay tribute to a woman that was a trailblazer. And I think that what we're seeing is women stepping up, women not being afraid to step up and saying, look, we can do this and we have the answers to make our community um, either on a local level or on a, on a state level or a national level better. Um, as it pertains to front runners, I agree that it's either Kamala Harris or it's uh, Elizabeth Warren, Warren um, because of you know, the issues that they're talking about. And it truly is about issues that impact um, everyday Americans. And um, really proud of the fact that this issue around children's separation is um, coming up and really um, people are focusing on that. The issues that um, years from now, generations from now, will look back and say, how could we allow this to happen? As we look back on a lot of different things that have happened in this country and say, how do we stand idly by and allow this to happen? And so I think that um, having a woman at the helm um, that can see and understand every side of it and make a decision that's both um, empathetic but, uh, and, and passionate, but also one that puts the people first is very, very important. And I think that either of those women could do it. Who has our next question? I have one. Sure. Um, what woman inspires you and why? Woman in politics. I, I, I would say, um, Astro, you know, with us or without, you know, not here anymore. Shirley Chisholm. Yes. Um, it's probably the, for me, the, the most inspirational. Um, because she was not afraid to stand up even when she had to stand by herself. Right. She um, stood on principle and did what she believed was the right thing to do at the right moment in time. And I think that um, that's being courageous and that's being a, a true leader. Um, I also um, really appreciate the service of um, Hillary Clinton. Um, I think that um, you know, she, you know, she got the short end of the, of the stick and uh, she did a lot um, as it pertains to working on behalf of children and putting children first and, and, and really raising the bar when it comes down to what we need to do in early education and, um, and supporting uh, children and families in our community. And so those two women, I believe, um, have been trailblazers. And I, I also, you know, appreciate what Alexandria Ocasio, 
is doing right now. And, and I think that she is going to definitely be a woman to watch um, because she's not afraid to do what's necessary in order to change the game uh, and to stand up for everyone um, and, and those that are most vulnerable in our community. Um, I have to say, which women in politics inspire me the most? I'm drawing a blank. I'm gonna be honest, I've always been kind of a trailblazer myself, and I credit that to my grandmother and also my daughter. My grandmother had so many challenges. Uh, my grandfather brought the family over, and they worked hard. He worked in the steel mill. My grandmother had six children. Her two youngest had muscular dystrophy, were in a wheelchair. My grandfather passed away. I still think it was uh, related to his work in the steel mill, the type of work that he did. And she persevered, and she never let anyone stand in her way. Even, I mean, we're talking about 50 years ago, all the, the blocks, the roadblocks that were thrown up in her way to get services for her sons. My grandmother stood strong and tall and was always a, a beautiful woman who was very passionate about her children and got them the services they need. Also, um, I think that's what inspired me. I'm, I feel so blessed, like I've been given a special gift to be the first female senator to represent the 54th district. Which I think so includes Seneca Falls, the birthplace of the women's rights movement. So it's a, it's a special honor and a spe special privilege. And I mentioned that I think my daughter has inspired me as well because in her life, I guess maybe I was more aware of how many times, she was very athletic, but how many times lousy coaches said to her, you'll never go far. She was a downhill ski racer, and I remember when she was in middle school, that critical time when you're sensitive about everything, her male ski coach said to her, you'll never go far because you don't have the right body build. And I can go on and on with the stories and the things that she had to face and the tragedies she overcame. And my goodness, she was a division one college lacrosse player. She went on to become a physician's assistant. She's a brand new mother. And I think she has inspired me. So I think, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on who inspired me from the political world, but it's, I draw from my family a lot. Um, so I'm gonna say Fannie Lou Hamer. And um, the reason why I'm choosing her is because I remember along the campaign trail, and I'm using this word kind of loosely, criticism, um, but I guess the more political, politically correct term is feedback. Um, but the criticism that I, that I got was, um, you know, Natalie, how are you gonna, how are you going to be an elected official and an activist at the same time because the two just don't mix? And what um, Fannie Lou Hamer, a lot of her messaging is around the fact that you are going to be um, inside of something that is so deeply entrenched, so strong, but you can't let that affect the way that you operate. So if you're going to be an advocate on the outside when you get in, you should also be an advocate as well. So I'm going with Fannie Lou. There's, there's many women I can think of, but one of the women that, that hasn't been mentioned that I think I would, would say is our, our late Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. In, in my previous role, in, in the last years of her, of her career, I had the extreme privilege to, to work with her and talk to her very personally and very frequently. And to listen to her stories and to you know hear the, the things she overcame when she was running for Monroe County Legislature in the 70s was, um, it was always just you know the ground that she broke to get where she was, and also to blaze the trail for the women that came up behind her, myself included, was always incredibly profound. And also just the fact that I would sit there. I I remember fangirling the moment when I was still a staffer that Louise just even knew my name, and I said, Oh, she knows me now. Um, and I think she was a tremendous model, just not to be about what it means to be a public servant in, in a legislative body, but also just to be a, an active member of the community. Um, the only other uh, person I would say, kind of touching on, you know, Pam, I, um, I think some people in here do know my mother, so you can't say that I said the story. Uh, but when, when I was a much younger uh, ball player, uh, my mother, then just a stay-at-home mom, went to a community meeting. She was trying to fight for certain access to resources and things, and somebody had told her in, in a meeting that she needed to go home and take drugs. So she did, and she brought them back to that next meeting. Um, so it's you know it's not it's it was one of those things that I was able to witness that definitely left a mark on me. Um, but I wanted to ask the senator, can I can I share with them what your nickname in Albany is? Which one? <laughs> 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 it was a good one. Uh, Pam Pam's been so.
such an amazing advocate, particularly for our shoreline communities with the flooding in 2017, with where, unfortunately, it looks like we're heading right now. Uh, but in our last meeting with the governor, we had to remind him uh, that, that her nickname is Pam, Pam Jam Helen Helen. So, <laughs> I just wanted to, to give her a shout out on that. Thank she you. is really Thank blazing you. her own trail. Yes. Thank you. Next question. can be kind of depend, but I, it, for personally for me, I think what I found for myself is, is you go back to your, your core team and you kind of figure out, you know, how do you stand tall, but it's more in the direction of how you're trying to either change the conversation or still get your point across maybe with a different avenue or a different way, um, but still trying to keep that, that principal stance that you were trying to get to originally. Um, because some of that also always depends on what, what it is, what issue you might, you might be working on, what program you might be trying to say. Because um, there are often times you don't, you've drawn that line in the sand and you can't really move. But it's, it's important to always stand on your principles, but sometimes it's always getting that feedback. Although I've also oftentimes tried to seek out uh, people I wouldn't necessarily consider in my core just to give myself that other kind of through the prism perspective of is there something I'm actually missing? Um, it's not always the case that there is, but sometimes that can be really helpful to get some input from someone that's outside of either the situation to see, is there something or a circumstance or a situation that I haven't missed that I should be thinking about or that I need to figure out how to mitigate or minimize because it's not the, the true weight that someone else might think it is. So I guess I can start off my response by saying I'm definitely a work in progress. Um, when it comes comes to how I handle getting a no, um, and that's because um, I guess I'll phrase it. I am younger um, in this field. A lot of times in the room. So right now I'm 32. When I ran, I was 29, 30. Sat when I was 31. And oftentimes in education, I am one of the youngest people in the room by far. Um, and so when I, when I get a no, it's like if I stand up against that or fight, right? That's me throwing a hissy fit because I'm younger, right? Um, I also have to take into account that I am a woman of color um, and sometimes when we get frustrated or we want, rightfully so, are angry, you know, I'm not going to shook, but I get mad. It, being in public education and really fighting for kids, it brings up those emotions, right? Um, that that is often sometimes misconstrued as being the angry black woman and so getting a no and like I said being a growing and growing in, in in this position it really has allowed me to understand that stepping back is okay that I don't always have to flip a table that the no <laughs> that the no you know it might be directing me to a better path to get a yes um, but it's definitely easier said than done I can tell you that because um, I just made the millennial cutoff, so shout out to the millennials. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and a lot of times we want to see things happen, what, here and now, right? So like, if, if we can do it now, let's do it now. Why do we have to wait? And so, but I do understand the importance of waiting. I understand the importance of sometimes going back and gathering more information. And so um, it's definitely um, a, a, a learning, learning situation for me. And it is helpful to definitely go back to my core mentor group. I, I kind of wanted to comment on, you know, it's a learning, it's experience. I'm in my late 50s, closer to 60, and it's an ongoing learning experience because I still struggle too. On the issues that I'm very passionate about, I have a hard time accepting that no as an answer. And so how do I react? It depends upon the situation. Sometimes I definitely let my voice be heard. I, you know, kick and scream and make my point clear. Other times I go back, build more consensus, and then reapproach the subject again, hoping to turn people around or, or demonstrate to them why it's important to um, 
come to a yes conclusion. So I think it's really, it's situation specific. It depends upon what we're talking about. So I'm not afraid to use my voice at all. And I agree, sometimes when you're a woman, it's just, you know, I've been labeled emotional or it's that time, or I want to say, buddy, I passed that time a long time. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's, the stuff that you have to endure, it's, it's just crazy sometimes. I definitely have to agree that it, it all depends on what the situation is. Some things um, you have to recognize that you may not be the expert on this particular subject and you need to go back, not just to your core team, but to other folks and ask the question and try to get additional information. Um, some issues is just I'm not going to compromise on. Um, and you know, I think that sometimes people want change. They don't want to go through the process of change. And you have to push back because they'll give you 99 reasons why you can't do this. And I you know, have to tell them, don't give me 99 reasons why I can't. Find the one way that you can make this happen. And uh, that gives people a different frame of reference, but it also gives people a sense that you're trying to push back and you're trying to flip over the table or you're upset about it. But no, it's saying that this is not something that I'm going to compromise on. I know that this issue is the right issue to fight for or, to, or or this is the right project or whatever it is and we need to make it happen and we need to figure out a way to make it happen. And so it all depends on what the issue is. Thank you. I would say get thick skin. Uh, I, would, I would say that you cannot wear your feelings on your sleeve and you cannot um, get into politics thinking that people are not going to, to treat you like they um, be condescending. Um, that um, sometimes because you're a woman, sometimes because you're a woman of color, sometimes because of your age, um, they may you know, try to talk down to you. They may try to uh, make you feel like you're um, less than or you don't know what you're talking about. And so what I would say to them is that, you know, stay true to who you are and don't try to be someone that you're not. And while you're doing that, make sure that you develop enough toughness to be able to withstand the criticism because it will come. But as long as you're based and you're grounded and you have a solid foundation on what you're trying to do and why you're getting into this, that it's not about you, it's truly about the community. Uh, many people don't know this. When I first ran for election, I was 25 years old. I lost by seven votes um, for city council. And um, I uh, lost. I, my grandmother was alive at the time, and I went to her, and you know, she said to me, um, it's not your time. Um, that was the best thing that could have happened to me, because during that time that I uh, waited, um, I truly learned what service was about. I had just graduated from college. I was a, a, an attorney. I, I graduated from law school, and I came home to Rochester, and I'm like, oh, well, this community needs me. I'm smart, I'm young, and you know, I'm a product of this district, and they are like, uh, no, we don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, during that time, I really learned that public service is truly not about the person that is sitting in the seat. The seat doesn't belong to you. The seat belongs to the community. And if you're getting into this because it's about you, then don't. Do it because you truly want to impact your community. And while you're doing that, make sure that you develop the strength that you need to be able to withstand whatever challenge may come your way, because they will come. And you'll have to stand on that foundation, and you'll have to know that you're, you're grounded in faith, and that's the reason why you're doing it. Um, and I would also tell them to get a mentor, whether that's a man or a woman, just someone that can guide them along the journey um, because it can be brutal at times 
but we need them. We need, we, we need whoever is going to step into this arena to step up and to be passionate about it, but also to do it for the right reasons. I think the mayor gave an absolutely excellent response to that. I'm not sure what more I can add. I totally agree that you have to have an understanding of who you are and what's important to you. And sometimes when you're young, you know, you're still discovering that. But if you write down what your core values are, what your passions are, and you stay true to those, you'll be okay. Um, when I first ran for office, I had no clue. I had really no political exposure. I, I ran for town supervisor in the town of Canandaigua, and I ran against a 12-year incumbent. Um, and he, he was a, a good person, but I just wasn't happy with some of the things that were happening in the town. So I decided that I was gonna run for the town supervisor's position. So many people came up to me, friends, and they said, Pam, don't do it. He's an incumbent, you'll never beat an incumbent, he's got a good record. So I decided I was gonna write to every single political um, committee that existed in our town. So Republicans, Democrats, independents and conservatives. I wrote to all of them. I told them about myself. I asked them if I could meet with them. And to make a long story short, I, you know, I started to learn the differences between the political parties. I really, I had never been exposed to that prior to this, but I did try to stay true to my beliefs, to my cores, and what my mission was. I wound up getting endorsed by all four parties. I wound up primarying the incumbent on his own political line and beating him. So you, you can do it. It's not always easy. I think the mayor's advice too, get a friend, get a mentor, get someone who you can trust and you can share ideas with or just, you know how it is. I mean, some days aren't good. It's rough, it's tough. You're gonna get called every name in the book and if you have someone you trust and you can have that conversation for it, but let some steam out, it really helps. <laughs> Um, so one of the quotes that I came up with was, um, don't let the intimidation of a brick wall stop you from climbing. And I, you know, I say that now with such clarity, but um, going through it, I can actually just speak from my experience. I, I was really crying. I was really down in the mud, beat up, um, just because I'm like, oh, they're saying I'm a baby, but like I got all these bills, like I'm a whole adult, right? Like that was my whole thinking. Um, but it, it really does, it really does weigh on you know, it weighs on the work that you know that you have done, right? So even though I'm young, I know um, I had to change my frame of mind, like, well, they're looking at it from the perspective that I literally haven't been on this earth long enough, right, to, to gain all of these experiences, but I do have these set of experiences. And so when I started to think about what it is that I actually bring to the table as a younger person in this work, um, that I was able to make them see and really connect with me to say like, okay, I understand that you bring this, and I also was like, well, I'm still learning, right? So I then had to look within myself to say, they're right, I, I, I am young, and so that means that you have something to offer me, and so how do I take um, lessons from you and, and the experiences that you've had? Um, and so for any young person running, you know, I would tell them, like, it, it, it is gonna be tough, like um, Mayor Lily Warren said, it is gonna be tough, um, you're, you're gonna get beat up, but at the end of the day, if your heart is in it, your passion is there, if you know that you're gonna be a lifelong learner, that nothing, literally nothing, is impossible for you at your age. To echo what all of my fellow panelists have said, I really think it would be to not be intimidated and to speak up, because I think that particularly for women, for young women, that there are ways that we can be intimidated through actions, but also just, you know, particularly having returned to Albany now as a member, Albany is going through a reckoning with a, a lot of new members, more women ever than ever in its history now serving in the legislature, but they're coming to a reckoning regarding the culture that they had had in Albany regarding harassment. And it is important, I think, particularly as, as women leaders, but also women that are getting involved, because that, that is going to be something that we, we hear more stories and hear things, but making sure that women, but anybody, you know, making sure that people are, are have the confidence to know that they can speak up and they always need to speak up, speak up, whether it's in a situation or to uh, somebody else and having that mentorship can be key, but making sure that they, they're preparing themselves to not be intimidated in any form, but also that they have to always speak up, whether it's something that they're fighting for or just for themselves to be in that room as well. I, I wonder how often you come across a bully in what, what you do, because like, Donald Trump was a major, he bullied everybody, but he like 
Hillary Clinton, like he was like hovering behind her in the debates, and she didn't really do anything about it. She just let him do it. And I just wonder how often you come across that, and like, what do you do to deal with a bully? And I so thank you for that question because that actually, for me, uh, kind of speaks to what I what I've been seeing kind of starting to change in Albany. When I first got to Albany, I was a chief of staff. I was 26 um, years ago for a state senate. Now, now I'm now 34 and a member. Um, but even back then, there were certain times where somebody might stand a little too close to you, maybe you're against the wall and they just are talking to you too closely or they're making a particular remark or you have to listen to an inappropriate conversation and you just, it's not necessarily bullying, but it's just you, you think this is just something you have to deal with. It's a, it's a form of intimidation. It, yeah. might not, it might not even be someone's overtly thinking, I'm going to say these things because it's just the culture and the way that things have always been. Um, and for a long time, a lot of women just would not say anything. And so that allowed some level of acceptance. There was a, an Albany-based reporter that just put out a column about mm -hmm. her interactions with a particular head of a, I guess I'll call it a government agency, and just how through now women talking to one another, they're seeing that this was a pattern of behavior and everybody was quiet, which was what allowed that to become the, the, it, the situation that it is right now. Um, that's really why, particularly now, when I used to recruit candidates or talk to other people, I never really got into that speaking up um, portion, but that's where I think we need more female lawmakers, even in those immediate circumstances. Excuse me, you need to step back, or excuse me, you sh you, I don't appreciate that you say that. The speaking up, I think, is gonna be, and I know, I think I had probably the same thought as you when watching this debate about walk away or turn around and tell him to speak up, and it's one of those, but I think that there, there was a, a long time where it's just, that's not what you did. And I think that encouraging more and more women, but also because anybody can, can face harassment. I think that's an important thing that knowing that we all should, even in those uncomfortable circumstances, we shouldn't fear speaking up and we should be making sure that we're empowering ourselves and each other to do that. So it's funny because initially in my head, I'm like, oh, is that a trick question? Like, can I really answer that? <laughs> like, because I'm, I'm a baby sister. I have two older brothers. So like, somebody's bullying me. I'm bullying my brothers, right? Um, but, um, you know, seriously, like in a political role, it's always on, on how you react and, and how much control you're able to have. And so for me, I mean, it, it does happen. I, I wouldn't say often, but it, when it does happen, what, what I do is um, I really just have confidence in what I know. And what I don't know, I know that person doesn't know I don't know it. So, I, you know, so I really, really stand firm in, in, in the things that, that I bring to the table. And so I'm not going to speak if it's not going to help the situation. Um, but just in regards to, I know we are talking about harassment and just really kind of physical posturing with that type of bullying. Um, I think what we're starting to see more and more is that women, and men too, that we're just, we're just not having it, right? So like before, where you kind of dominated a field, um, it's not okay. And I'm gonna say it's not okay. And, and if you don't agree, then too bad for you because now we have, what, regulations and state laws that are gonna back us. So even if I didn't say it, then somebody, you know, at the state said it, and we will take, we'll take it all the way to court if that's what needs to happen. And I think well, what I see is that that's kind of making this push and really giving um, people that energy to say if you're being wronged or you're being harassed or you're being bullied in whatever way, that it is okay to speak up because you will have that protection. Whereas in the past, you wouldn't have seen that type of protection for you. So I think um, just looking at this group, this panel here, I don't think any of us are gonna struggle with saying back off or else. <laughs> but my concern is uh, because of a few tragedies that have occurred in my Senate district, I've gotten more involved with domestic violence issues. And I see a desperate need to train our young people on how to speak up, you know, how, what's right, what's wrong, how to say no, how to push back. I think there's a desperate need to do more in that area. I know many women who are extremely intelligent, extremely incredible people, but they're in domestic violence situations. They just don't know how to get out of that abusive situation. So whatever we need to do to empower our young people, to empower families, women, and even men who are in those situations, there's there's just so much more work to be done. And, and this is one thing I'll say about New York State. This is one of my missions. Um, every county 
in New York State has a domestic violence shelter, except for three, and two of those are my counties, counties that I represent. I just don't find that acceptable in this Bay Area. And thankfully, last year, we were able to secure funding and working with a, through a public-private partnership, we are going to have a shelter built that will cover two of those counties. So we just have one more left. But there's, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, a lot more. And also, Seneca County, which I represent, kind of goes along with the bullying. They have the highest suicide rate in New York State. And so many of the families that I talk to, it's, they attribute it back to bullying. So there, there's much, much more work that we have to be done. And honestly, I think it starts with all of us, right? As a politician, there are times, um, I think I'm in the minority right here as far as political party, but there are times when we do, we bash each other based on our political party, or I know I'll say, this is the result of our, our downstate leadership. That's name calling, right? That's bullying, and, and our young people learn from us. So I think a lot of it, it stems with us, it starts with us, we've got to stop the name calling. We have to think about our own actions and change our own actions. That'll help, but we also need a lot of funding for a lot more programs to help out. So I, I don't necessarily see um, physical posturing bullying. What I see a lot of is cyberbullying. And um, in going along with what the Senator just outlined, the cyberbullying is not just affecting adults, it's affecting our children and they're watching us. And they're watching the things that we're saying on, on social media and um, things that you would never, ever say to someone's face. And um, actually, I would dare them to say it to my face, right? So, um, <laughs> so you know, I, I think that that is, um, that is where the emboldness is, is coming from. And uh, even, you know, all the way from the, the top in, in our country with, with Twitter and, you know, Facebook and Instagram, Instagram it is becoming um, the space where people feel free to destroy and to demean and to degrade. And there is no filter and there's really no compassion. And I um, recently was at RIT and one of the students said, if you had a magic wand and you could do anything in the world, what would it be for your, your city? And um, it took me a while and I was say to, and I said to him, I said, I would, um, I would like for our city and everyone in our city to be more compassionate. Because if you can show compassion and feel compassion for what someone else is going through, the decisions that you make, the things that you say, the the, the choices that you um, that that you make would be completely different. Um, it wouldn't be that you have um, that that when you have racist tendencies or underlying uh, sexism or other things that you just wouldn't act on it. You would uh, change yourself and you would show uh, more humility. And I think that that's what's lacking is the fact that we have lost our compassion for one another and we have allowed the internet to dehumanize people and their feelings. And so the bullying is not taking place face to face, it's taking place over a space where you, know, you feel comfortable because you know that I can't say anything back to you. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm in a position where I just have to take it. Many of our children are in those positions where they feel like they just have to take it. And I watch adults be so, so mean. And it is truly, truly unfortunate, unfortunate that our community and our country has come to this. This gentleman in the back, you had a question, I'm sorry. I, I think I can see you, I don't think that Shannon can. <laughs> so, um, as I look around the room, um, outside of the um, chamber employees and outside of the, the sponsoring representative, there's two men in this room. Um, what do you think needs to be done so that more men are invited, or not invited, but more men are coming to conversations like this about women, um, especially around politics and more 
less so with more sense. I think that we have to make sure that we're inviting them and that they know that they can come. And I, you know, sometimes people self-select out and, and we don't say, this is a woman of politics event, but we want men to come to be able to understand the perspective from a woman that's in politics and how they, they feel about different issues that they're impacted by. But I also think that we need to um, break down the, the, the barriers and the silos and that, that, that discussion and conversation when we talk about bullying, um, that we really work together to build a bridge, that we're all in this together. This is our community, this is our state, this is our country. And it's not a, you know, an adversarial relationship. Many times, if we really got to the meat of it all, we all want the same things. We all want to be able to grow up in a safe environment, be able to take care of our families, be able to leave a lasting legacy for our children, be able to uh, provide for um, you know, not only ourselves, but for our, our, our families. And that's at the heart of everything that we want, whether you're black, white, male, or female, and, or Hispanic, or you know, Asian. And I think that if we got down to the bottom of it, we would realize that we have so much more in common than we have in, than we disagree on, that, that um, we could break down those silos and build those bridges if you start off with what do we have in common instead of what do we not like about each other. Um, so I would say really trying to shape um, how we express a, a woman's in politics type of event. So um, by that I mean men are allies to the work that we do. And so if we can get them to understand that they play a role in the women's movement as well, um, I think that that will kind of start shifting mindsets to say that, okay, you should be, um, I don't wanna call the girls club, but you can come in today, right? Like you can come in and listen because what, if, what ends up happening is we always see an either or, like it either has to be a man or a woman. And, and, and really what it is is, and I don't wanna sound you know cliche and corny, but it really is teamwork, right? Like it's a mix. We obviously, women, are not going anywhere, right? And in fact, we're, we're pushing ourselves and infusing ourselves into a system that has pre uh, previously been male dominated. And so the fact is that we're here. And, and we're not trying to compete with you. What we're trying to do is make sure that the issues and the concerns that all of our communities face, that we're working together to make those things better. And so the allyship piece is what I think that we um, can, can really play upon that to really get more male involvement in events like this. I think one of the other things will be more gentlemen like yourselves or the others in the room that are willing to talk to your own networks as well because I think some of it too will be, you know, we'll, we'll continue to set the table for some of these conversations, but the more that, you know, our allies are able to go out there and try to build those branches, I think is what is, will help continue that growth as well. Thank you. One, once again, my name is Viviana. One of the things that really worries me is you hear reports of in, in terms of um, natural resources of whales dying because they're filled with plastic and all this pollution. And I'm just like, wow, what kind of a, what are we leaving for the next generations? And I was just wondering if you ladies could speak upon that about initiatives that you may be working on in terms of, of protecting our, our, protecting Earth, protecting the resources for the next generations. Um, one of the, I guess I'll say little known or maybe well known facts about myself is I actually got my start in, in public service and I guess I'll say politics when I was an eight year old and I got my neighborhood kids together up in around the point where I live and we started picking up the litter off the drain at the beach and that ended up turning into an event that we've now done for 25 years. Um, but through that environmental stewardship, I mean fortunately this year New York State did take a lot of different initiatives to try to the state 
create some policies that will make it easier for us to be better stewards of the environment. We did just recently pass the most comprehensive climate change protection package, which still is, does not necessarily detail a lot of the plan, but setting some very high standards of trying to reduce carbon emissions for the next year, so that way we're reducing our carbon footprint as a, as a um, state. Uh, but I think that when it comes to you know what we're leaving for the next legacy, it's it's really important that you know there's there's large collective actions that we do need to take as organizations and businesses, but it's also really gets fueled again by the individual decisions that we all make as parents, as consumers, as just neighbors in our neighborhood about the type of products that we're choosing to buy or the types of investments that we're trying to make or our own practices with are we recycling. Are we making sure we're using post-consumer paper products? There's a lot of things that we can do to model that behavior that we want to see the, the companies that we're patrons of or the governments and the people that we support do. But some of that starts, I think, really from a strong grassroots foundation where I think there's a lot. And that's probably, I would say, um, having been involved in environmental efforts for a couple decades now, um, I think the growth of that grassroots movement has really what started to really turn and has finally started trickling up to those higher levels because a lot of people have continued to stand out and speak on that. So for me specifically within the Rochester City School District, you think about, well, how do you get kids you know, involved in things? And the one component is to make it fun, right? Then kids will want to get involved. And so what I do is I support some of the initiatives that have already been in place. One, which is um, there's a national recycling competition where um, you, you, know, you collect and, and recycle for a period of time. Um, we had a few schools that won with some of the higher averages nationally this year. Um, and also, just in regards to how we use paper and what we're seeing education turn into digitally. Um, just supporting those efforts from the state level on really getting electronics and technology into our schools more modernized so that we aren't using more paper, have, don't have a lot of waste um, with, within our school districts. So those are some of the things that we're doing within RCSD that I support. So I've pretty much spent my life working in environmental compliance. I think the battery's going dead. This is an area that I'm very passionate about. You know, there are high level things we've done at the state, but locally, I think one of the things I'm most proud of is um, just this year, we passed what's called the Finger Lakes Preservation Act. So in my district that I mentioned earlier includes all of these beautiful Finger Lakes where we literally hundreds of thousands of people draw their drinking water from. Um, we had a developer come in and propose to build a waste incinerator. It was just three miles from two of the lakes and about five miles from a small school. And in addition to that, not far away, we have three of the largest landfills in New York State. And most of the waste that's coming into this area is coming from the New York City area. So working together with business owners, bringing together environmentalists, business owners, power producers, and everyone, we were able to come to a compromise, get this bill passed that um, does not allow any new incinerators to be built within a certain geographical area of the Finger Lakes. It was a huge accomplishment. Again, something that so many people said, you're never gonna do it, give it up, you're never gonna do it. But for a year and a half, we really worked hard to bring everyone together to get something in place that um, the assembly was comfortable with, the Senate was comfortable with, comfortable with, it passed both houses unanimously, which really sent a strong message to Governor Cuomo that you better sign it. You know, when both houses are passing it, you better sign it. So that was a big accomplishment. It's just one example. I host a number of youth leadership forums on environmental issues. Uh, when I was a town supervisor, I set up a joint program for a waste transfer station where the goal was diversion. In Webster coming up, I have an e-waste event, recycling event. There's a number of things, and this is an issue that I truly am passionate about, could talk about forever. So if you want to talk more, we can do it offline. <laughs> So the city of Rochester is doing a lot when it comes down to um, preparing our community for the future. I have an eight-year-old daughter and I want this city to be just as good to her as it was to me. And so we have um, just last year unveiled our first solar array um, farm that actually powers um, uh, some of our city buildings. We are looking at um, how to have our community access neighborhood solar. Um, as well. Uh, we have um, really changed our fleet 
Um, we are, um, you know, trying to be um, carbon emissions free by, I believe, 2035. We've made that commitment in 2040. Uh, we have put in not only rain barrels as well as um, um, green gardens, green roof gardens. We are doing um, urban agriculture. Um, we are trying to uh, start, and we're doing a study right now to start a, 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 a pilot for composting. Um, we are also looking at um, uh, changing all of the LED lighting, all the, the lights in, in, in our community um, uh, that are powering our street lights, but also the ones that are in our, our buildings. Um, we have really looked at um, what we're doing around our water and, and preserving our water and making sure that we are uh, replacing pipes and all of that. And so we have a, a complete plan that has been outlined um, and uh, supported by NYSERDA. Uh, we are also looking at energy and uh, ways to have more community-based energy. Um, I think it's called community choice aggregation that um, would give people a, um, a, an opportunity to opt out of community you know, sort of energy plan. And so there are a number of different initiatives that we are working on as it pertains to sustaining our, our city for the future. And we call it Sustainable Rochester. We want a cleaner, greener city. And there's an entire plan that we have for that. And if you want to go to www.cityofrochester.com, you can read all about it. Thank you. Okay, so we have time. Beautiful intern. <laughs> sharecropping. My father came to this country from Trinidad and Tobago. He came here as an illegal immigrant um, and he wanted a better opportunity for himself and for the next generation. And so they instilled in, in, in my, my mom, they instilled in me that without hard work you'll never be able to accomplish anything. Nothing is ever going to be given to you. Um, the other, um, you know, I would say my, my last is um, really um, my own sort of inner feeling, right? Um, at the end of the day, whatever decision, whatever choice that I make, um, at the end of the night, I need to be able to look at myself in the mirror and know that I did it for all the right reasons. And if I can't look myself in the mirror and know that the decisions that I made or um, the, the, what I'm getting ready to do, is for the right reasons, then I know that it isn't based on faith and it's not based on my hard work or my ability to do the hard work. And so all three of those have to align for me and those are my core principles. And that's what gets me through um, those rough days <laughs> because there are some rough days, but at the end of the night, I know that I can look myself in the mirror, look at myself in the mirror and know that I did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Great question. And I think my core values are similar to the mayor's. My family is always first, my faith. And also, um, you know, I never ever intended to run for the New York State Senate. It was never part of my plan to do that. But I have to say, you know, my first year, after I started to get the flow of things, figure out how things worked in New York State now being, it's crazy. But um, I started to realize what was most important to me was to be true to myself and to be true to my constituents, to stand up for what I told them that I would stand up for, to make sure their voices are heard. And um, I have to say,
say when I, I got the position and I worked through that initial rough period where you're really learning everything, it's just like the mayor said, it's at the end of the day, being true to yourself and be able to look yourself in the mirror and make decisions based on what, like I said, what's important to your constituents, what you've said you've done, that you deliver on those things. I really work hard to make sure that I'm getting feedback from my constituents. Um, in my first, during my first term, I, heard, I held more than 32 town hall meetings all over my district. And that was during the six months that we were not in session in Albany. I do so many um, surveys, online surveys, I mail out surveys. I try to be everywhere in each of the six counties um, as much as possible just to get feedback from people to find out what's important to them so that I can take that back to, me, to Albany and make sure that I'm representing what the people want. Um, but I just want to say, in case we don't get a chance, thank you so much for hosting this event. It has been absolutely fantastic. Um, one of my main core values is integrity. Um, coming into this role, you think about um, how there's a, a negative stigma on just being a politician, right? You can't trust politicians. They say one thing um, to you, and then behind the scenes, they do something different. And so what I try to maintain um, just is that consistency with people understanding that what I'm telling you is exactly what I'm doing when you're not looking or when the cameras aren't rolling. Um, and so integrity is, is my main thing and then consistency. And, and when I say I try, it was in regards to consistency, consistently letting the community know what is actually going on. Um, that's a tough thing to do um, when things are constantly changing every day, all of the time or when you might say something here and then you go back to a meeting and circumstances have changed so you haven't had the opportunity to update the community before you've changed your mind on a decision. And so consistency and integrity are definitely my core values in this role. One of my core values that I think started off when I was a much younger version of myself and I was just a, a kid that was trying to make a difference in the world was to was to be the change that I wanted to see. And I know that's kind of a corny phrase, but it was making sure that similar to a lot of our other panelists have said, the, the decisions that you make and the actions that you take, making sure that you are being true, not only to yourself, but to that change that you might want to see. Were you, were you living out the change or the vision that you saw for the rest of the world and the actions you want to see in the community or the the different ch choices you would hope other people would make were you making those same choices. Um, and that's kind of a, an ever evolving one that I think is it's hard to pinpoint, but it's always one that I constantly st strive to try to get to because I think it was important that in, in the many different facets of life that if you want to see the world change, you have to make sure that you're being a part of it or contributing to that. So with the things that you can control in your life, are you fulfilling that goal? Um, and that's kind of not ever evolving not a target. Great, thank you all so much. And Susan Durr is gonna come back up to conclude the program. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to Shannon and our panelists. A round of applause for them.